At this time, we take you to the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Willow Avenue and 17th Street, for regular Sunday services. The message this morning will be delivered by Israel A. Smith, President of the World Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My address is that Christianity offers the only means of securing world peace. World peace is possible only through the principles of Jesus Christ. Democracy is too often accepted as a pattern of government with political organizations, bodies, and officers. But democracy is more of the nature of spirit. It consists largely of concepts of human beings about themselves. Fortunately and significantly, these concepts, the concepts are of Christian origin. As one of the leading democratic nations, we are also one of the principal exponents of Christianity. We are not Christian in any formal religious sense. That is, we have no state church. Our churches are more or less empty on Sundays, and our citizens break the Ten Commandments as well as other laws and ordinances every Sabbath day. But nevertheless, it is Christian because the golden threads of Christianity have run throughout our history. The central doctrine of our political system, as has been said, is the inviolability of the individual, which has come down through 2,000 years of Christian insistence that the human soul is immortal. Christian philosophy is evident in the arguments of our statesmen and in pleas before the courts as witnessed the daily debates of Congress and the magnificent advocacy of the Christian religion by Daniel Webster in the famous Gerard Will Contest case, as also in the customs and manners of the people. Present civilization is the direct result of the crusade made by Christians during long and dark centuries in Europe. But the death of Christian influences which America owes has not been greatly increased during recent decades. Indeed, Material progress has lately far outdistanced the spiritual, and the reason for this is that the church has failed to teach its doctrines successfully in modern times. There has been an alarming decline in spiritual values with increased emphasis on materialism as a modern, may we say, streamlined theory of life. A college president visited Europe ten years ago and related his experiences. He made the following observations which discloses, in my opinion, what has been the cause of present world disorder. He said, two or three hundred million people are now living under dictators, dictators with scientific weapons at their disposal of such destructiveness that civilization conceivably could be wiped out if they are ever loose and under a political organization which gives men no choice. It is impossible for anyone who has not seen it to sense fully the degree to which democracy and human liberty have been crushed on the continent of Europe. There is a definite correlation between the decline of freedom and democracy and the decline of Christianity in these countries. There is not one among us pharisaical enough to condemn these people struggling to live for the very bread with which to feed themselves and their children. They are caught by a great and evil matrix which binds them to forms and usages which in many cases must express the opposite of their heart's desires. In the centers of learning and power, the idea of a personal God is revealed to us in the New Testament, and to whom every individual and every nation is accountable, has almost, if not entirely, disappeared. Philosophy, probably I should say not the philosophy which the Greeks glorified, but rather half-baked philosophers and our incomplete interpretation of a developing science have been factors in this uprooting. In the quest for wealth and power, rulers perforce must deny the validity of a doctrine which would invalidate them if their followers ever accepted it. In any case, and whatever the cause, in critical and evil relationship to a supreme being has disappeared. These nations no longer believe that they are accountable to this just judge for their acts. Christendom, so-called, has, to a marked degree everywhere, become godless. 
Christianity, under the benign influence of which our civilization has developed, is now denied by the very nations it made great and powerful. This is treason, probably the most serious treason ever committed upon earth. And who can believe that we can escape the penalty for such an act? President Dr. Sproul, President of the University of California, says of our own United States, we have the peculiar spectacle of a nation which, to some imperfect but nevertheless considerable extent, practices Christianity without actively believing in Christianity. It practices Christianity because the teachings of the church have been absorbed into its culture. But it fails to believe because it is no longer effectively taught. Christian leadership in America has passed from the church to the active and practical laity, the statesmen and educators, the communists, the scientists and great men of action. And he closed by saying, there is only one way out, the sound of a voice coming not from ourselves in the existence of which we cannot disbelieve. It is the earthly task of the pastor to hear this voice, to relate it convincingly and to tell us what it says. If they cannot hear it, or if they fail to tell us, we as laymen are utterly lost. Without it, we are no more capable of saving the world than we were capable of creating it in the first place. Is this not a voice crying in the wilderness, seeking prophetic leadership? And is not the world in dire need of a way in which to perpetuate itself, to save its boasted civilization? I thank the God, said Plato, that I was born a Greek and not a barbarian, that I am a man and not a woman, and that I live in the days of Socrates. Taking liberties with Plato and adopting the idea to my own life, I am glad I was born an American and not a barbarian, and in the days of the greatest civilization yet witnessed since the world were set in motion through the universe. In the span of my lifetime, I have seen greater advancement in science and invention than was witnessed since the world began up to my time, and also the zenith of civilization in the world since the days of the master of men. In the beginning of the Christian dispensation, 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I, if I be lifted up, will raise all men after me. He was lifted up, and I believe that all men, even obscure people of darkened minds, have been raised up or enlightened because of the influence of his people. In a recent Saturday evening post, there appears an article by Will Durant, philosopher and lecturer, with the title, What is Civilization? He asks the question, will civilization survive? Will our children see the suicide of civilization or a brave new world? How do the people of the earth today rank in the degree and quality of their civilization? Will the association of science and war destroy our civilization? Knowledge is proud that he has learned so much. Wisdom is humble that he knows no more. The world should be energetic in considering this with all our knowledge. Civilization can be preserved. So unusual and extraordinary and alarming are the conditions in the world. Who besides divinity can see the end? Who knows the results? What are the nations of the world coming to? What are the potential dangers to our own nation? Wise men there are who may know, prophets there probably are who have assurance of the outcome. But since the whole world seems to be suffering from common and growing and serious ailments, one is justified in asking the general question, do human institutions give us any assurance? If they fail, can we avoid chaos and anarchy and universal bloodshed? If they are failing us, must all humanity go down, be destroyed. The world is filled with institutions which are the creations of human time. We may witness their universal failure. It is possible. There are those who say there is a universal law which operates to the disintegration of social organisms, that when their basic or fundamental or underlying idea is exhausted, down they go. Now we have a very complex civilization with millions of organizations, nations, states, counties, international orders, civic societies too numerous to classify, and of course, included with all of these are the churches or religious movements. All social organisms which are subjected to this law 
Yet it is a law. All these, one would think, some should endure. Since primitive men have always organized in self-defense, or for purposes of self-preservation. And we are now told that all such organisms, like physical organisms, have their inception, infancy, youth, maturity, old age, and then death. All of them doomed to die when least before their existence fails. It is said they generally have been destroyed by forces which they themselves have generated and set in motion, but which they were unable to control. Does it not already appear that even our own nation is vexed by all our complex machinery of politics and streamlined or modern government, with Congress in continuous session making laws without end? A German writer, Stengler, 15 years ago, in his book, The Decline of the West, said of world conditions then existing, what we are now facing is no near crisis but the beginning of catastrophe, the beginning of the end of civilization, created in modern times under the leadership of Great Britain, the Germans, French, and the Americans. Ten years later, he added, we have created a mechanical, industrial, technological civilization on which many millions depend for their very existence. That civilization is doomed by forces generated but not controlled by it. That's the fact that has overtaken all human civilizations when they have run their course from infancy to old age is now descending upon us. There is no possibility of escape, he said. But one thing remains for us. We must prepare to die gamely and honorably. We are in the hands of fate, he said. Inexorable, rigid and stern fate. After such a prediction, made by a man of so much prominence, we must test about us to see if there is a way of escape for us. Let us hope, for when there is no way through, under, or around, Christians can always find a way up. Dr. John Lord, who wrote a half hundred years ago in his Deacon Lights of History, said the history of various civilizations of the world had proved that civilization and spirituality are not necessarily concomitant, that when civilizations have been at their height, spirituality has almost always been on the decline. The cause of this phenomenon is not is that society gets its virtue largely from the so-called common people. Civic virtue continually wells up from the people, while society, the so-called cultured class, rots at the top. When the basic purpose of a movement ceases or is exhausted, as I have stated, then a crisis is precipitated. The people become decadent, they lose vigilance, dictators arise, and democracy is doomed. No, it is quite evident that civilization carries no assurance of spirituality. For example, it is said that all roads in art lead to Florence. Yet authoritative historians claim spirituality has been decadent in Florence for 1,400 years. And after crises in civilization, wars have inevitably followed. May we not discuss here briefly three recent ideologies in state government, three notable cases, all of them wrong. Fascism, in this form of government, the state is made paramount and of sole importance. The worth of the common man vanishes. He may be sacrificed without compunction in the interest of the state. In Hitlerian Germany, the welfare of but one race is considered. All others may be destroyed, and in the case of some, they must be exterminated. The Nordic overall, and especially over the Jewish. Consequently, Jews by the millions were killed for the good of one allegedly select race. The ideologies of Hitler and Mussolini seem to have been totally discredited, and the state created by them is destroyed. But the one great example of communism is that of Russia, where the whole theory of government is that it exists for but one stratum of society, the working class. All other classes were liquidated by the millions, and the working class was exalted and made supreme. Communism has been anti-Christ in theory and practice. There is no question that all these forms and theories of government have within them the seeds of their own destruction. States become jealous. Races will continue to oppose the supremacy of others. Likewise, the classes of society will be continually at war. Let us take a closer look at communism. 
which today has a threat not only toward the peace of the world, but also to our own country. Communism is fundamentally material. Christianity is spiritual. Christianity is dedicated to love and peace among all men. Communism to hatred and war. Christianity glorifies God. Communism denies him. Communism denies individual human rights. Christianity exalts them. Communism says that men, man and all his institutions are the tools, agents, and slaves of the state. Christianity teaches that the state is a servant of man and his institutions. One says the state is omnipotent, the other that God only is all-powerful. One disrupts the whole, the other preserves it. One demands class warfare, the other seeks to help all groups. Christianity subscribes to all these absolute truths that man is a child of God, created in his image, that our Lord came into the world to show what a child of God should and could be, that all law is based on morality, and morality comes only from God. It then appears the most natural thing in the world when Christianity fails to try these governmental nostrums. Christianity, for some reason or other, has failed in these countries. For hundreds of years, Christianity's fundamental and basic idea was the preaching of Jesus Christ, the theory of the Sermon on the Mount. But there has come a time when the people, having itching ears, a yearning for fantastic theories and lectures, have gathered unto themselves teachers to give service to God, and deny the power thereof, just as foretold in prophecy. Therefore, the underlying basic cause has failed, the Christianizing forces of the world are being rapidly frustrated and defeated. Men and states have been raised by the Christ to great heights. He has drawn all men unto him. But now apparently old age has set in, and death is present. All kinds of panaceas have been offered in place of Christian principles. Yet these fantastic theories in government have failed and will continue to fail because they have disregarded and do ignore the one great thing that Christianity has always kept to the forefront. They have stopped short of the real thing. They are not even half answers. What is the right solution to our world ills? The answer is that the Christian is the only one who views humanity as a whole. To him, the unit is the individual man cooperation between men and men, all as creatures of the divine mind with certain inalienable rights. So when I say I am glad I was born an American, I'm not a barbarian, I have in mind the principles of the Declaration of Independence, which declared we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Under the aegis of, the, of that Declaration of Independence, a people have been developed great enough, altruistic enough, to take over a country such as the Philippines, and after teaching them capacity of government, have launched them as an independent country, whom Spain and Japan would enslave, America makes free and independent. About a year ago, on board the battleship Missouri, in Tokyo Bay, surrender documents bringing to an end the greatest war of all time were to be signed. A few days before the birth of atomic power had been announced, Hiroshima and Nagasaki had been destroyed by it. Through the miracle of radio, there came to a listening world the words of General MacArthur. We have had our last chance, he said solemnly. If we do not now derive some greater and more equitable system, Armageddon will be at our door. Those present and the whole world listened to his potent words as he continued. The problem, basically, is theological and involves a spiritual recrudescence and improvement of human character that will synchronize with our almost matchless advance in science, art, literature, and all nat material and cultural developments of the past 2,000 years. It must be of the spirit if we are to save the flesh. No truer words were ever spoken. But if mankind is going to witness material or physical salvation, there must be a spiritual awakening worldwide in scope, a refinement of character, a readjustment of its ideals. The threat is not the atom bomb, it is man himself. As one writer puts it, 
we hold in our hands the basic power of the universe, the ultimate energy that creates and destroys the stars. What is wrong with our civilization that we need live in fear of what enlightened men may do? Civilizations have moved in cycles is an old theory. It remained for Dr. Sorokin to define the basic causes for changes in cultures which may assist in solving the present perplexities. Whether a new culture is to succeed, we must depend on the old one. I say in all seriousness, the world events and world events during the next 10 years will again demonstrate its truth that if civilization is saved, it will have to be done on the basis of the Sermon on the Mount. Can it be saved? Will it be saved? It can, but probably will not be. Out in my own state, you know I live in President Truman's hometown with a significant name of independence. Just 12 miles away is Liberty, 40 miles away is Lexington. All these names to Americans are sacred in their association. Out there at Liberty some weeks ago, they conferred an honorary degree on President Truman, and a great world scholar, Manly O. Hudson, another Missourian, by the way, in making a commencement day address, said, I see no grave danger of a world war during a decade or more to come, yet in this period, currents will be forming, and forces will be shaping which again could lead us to Armageddon. ordinary man who's at the end of his tether, and only a small, highly adaptable minority of the species can ever possibly survive. If Mr. Wells is right, we should be doing something about it. Man's extremity is God's opportunity, and we may be actually on the edge of a world catastrophe. When wise men speak to us, well may we question, is this the beginning of the death agony of our civilization? or but the birth pangs of a desirable change from one fundamental set of ideals to another. A few years ago, Wendell Wilson went around the world and published his book called One World, in which he demonstrated that the whole world is so bound together that all the peoples of the earth are interdependent. And now, within the recent weeks, a book has appeared written by nine of the great scientists who developed the atomic bomb. That book is called One World or None. They show that it is mandatory upon all nations now that such destructive methods as the atomic bomb have been discovered and developed, that we have a world organization to preserve the peace of the world. The great nations have responded to this situation and are struggling through the United Nations to bring about peace among all people. Disquieting as all this appears, are they saints believing in the promises of God? We must leave Wells and Spengler and other Jeremiahs of doom in the hands of faith while we stand by our original faith and stay in the hands of God. That is, if we are sufficiently wise, humble, and prayerful to be worthy of his salvation. In 1938, a, a convention of 500 ministers of Christian churches met in Bombay. They found that the world was in a dense fog of spiritual darkness, that this darkness, darkness was attributable to the fact that the principles of Jesus Christ had not been sufficiently known among them, and that the great past of the church the one was to be obedient to the mandate of Jesus quoted in the 28th chapter of Matthew when he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I believe these Christian gentlemen were correct. For more than 100 years ago, Joseph Smith, the American prophet who founded this church, wrote, Fear and tremble, O ye people, for what I, the Lord, have decreed shall be fulfilled. And verily I say unto you, that they who go forth bearing these tidings unto the inhabitants of the earth, to them is power given to seal both on earth and in heaven, the unbelieving and rebellious. Yea, verily, to seal them up unto the day when the wrath of God shall be poured out upon the wicked without measure. Unto the day when the Lord shall come to recompense unto every man according to his work, and measure to every man according to the measure which he has measured to his fellow man. Wherefore, I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which would come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called my servant, Joseph Smith, Jr., and spake unto him from heaven, and gave him commandments, and also gave commandments to others, that they should proclaim these things unto the world, and all this that it might be for which was written by the prophets, 
The day speedily cometh. The hour is not yet. But it is nigh at hand, when peace shall be taken from the earth, and the devil shall have power over his own dominion, and also the Lord shall have power over his saints, and shall reign in their midst. Again, through that same American prophet, we find that the following was revealed to the people of this church. Behold, verily I say unto you, I give unto you this first commandment, that ye, ye shall go forth in my name, every one of you, and ye, and ye shall go forth in the power of my spirit, preaching my gospel, declaring my word like unto angels of God, and ye shall go forth baptizing with water, saying, Repent ye, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now here is my authority for saying our basic and underlying idea was and is to preach the gospel to all the world. Has that basic idea been eliminated or exhausted? Have forces been set in motion by our own church which we cannot control, which will destroy the mission work of this church? I say most assuredly no. In the midst of all this world commotion, what should we believe? We cannot gloss over or deny the terrible conditions prevailing everywhere. And we believe that through the United Nations or any other human institution, utopian peace is to be permanently secured? Is the world defined through these measures a thousand years of peace, or will it be Armageddon? When I say Armageddon, I do not refer to another world war between nations. I refer to a condition in the world when the blood of men will be shed by their own neighbors. Civil strife, a time when there will and can be no escape to obedience to the voice of a supreme God. That same American prophet, Joseph Smith, in his corrected version of this Bible, added some paragraphs to the fifth chapter of Genesis, among which I find this. And thus the gospel began to be preached from the beginning, being declared by holy angels sent forth from the presence of God and by his own voice and by the gift of the Holy Ghost. And thus all things were confirmed unto Adam by an holy ordinance, and the gospel preached and a decree sent forth that it should be in the world until the end thereof, and thus it was. I prefer to call that the royal decree, that mankind, among whom wickedness and sin always existed, always has had the same means of salvation and escape that they had from Abraham's time on down to, and including the meridian of time when the Savior, who was the Word made flesh, appeared among us. But the royal mandate was the injunction of Jesus when he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all the way even unto the end of the world. Yes, that would be, that should be yet the basic idea of the Christian church. That is undoubtedly the basic and fundamental idea of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Has that idea exhausted itself? If it has, then this church, like all other Christian churches in like situation, has prepared itself for disintegration and failure. If that basic idea is still dynamic and dominant, then there is hope for us as a church. Great civilizations have come and gone since the dawn of creation. The dust of untold centuries conceals the ruins of many great civilizations. Great nations have come and gone, some within recent years. But so long as we keep alive our basic structure, the fundamental purpose for which we were organized in 1830, preaching the gospel to the peoples of the world, advocating the ministry and salvation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, then the future of our church will be secure. And we can keep alive some hope for the millions of beings who are sinking in the quagmire of present world conditions. It must not fail. It will not fail. As long as we have a faithful ministry and devoted membership to carry the banner of King Emmanuel. To this end, may God help us, is my prayer.